Dr. Sue, I've requested you turn your camera on. Just done. There she is. Hi, Dr. Sue. Uh, it's so good to see you and everyone at LA and everyone far beyond. And you as well. I'm so excited that we um, are together today to have a conversation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, I'll guide us through that. So our Good. theme for the month, Dr. Sue, is transformations, a way of life. And mm -hmm. so before I ask you the question, for those that may not know you, Dr. Sue Rubin is a legend in the movement of the science of mind movement, religious science, new thought. She was groundbreaking and um, on her journey of not only finding this teaching and um, becoming a minister and changing countless number of lives over the years, but packed up her kids and moved to Canada and started a new ministry there and then came back to LA and expanded one there. And you've just been a, um, a catalyst for change for so many people on our planet. And I've known you for, I don't know, 30 years now, I think it is, something like that. But one of the things that you're also so um, very well known for is how deeply steeped you are in the principle of life itself. And so when we speak of transformations, what does that mean to you from that perspective? It's always an inside job, but one correction, and it was probably the biggest part of my journey. I actually didn't take my kids with me when I went to Canada. Oh. Two of them were grown and already out on their own, and I left my 20-year-old at home. So he didn't leave home. Mother left home. Mother left, got it. And so for me, Keith, as you know, because I think we speak the same language along with so many of our colleagues. There is one essence of our being and to grasp the significance and the magnificence of that essence, intelligence, wisdom, and love, and to make it a living part of our every experience is the whole game of life. And so I was blessed, I believe, to be trained by what then was called an absolutist in the science of mind, Dr. Tom Johnson. As Tom would say, raise your hand if you know me. And so he just said, there's only mind, the same mind that brings you into whatever experience you're having at the moment. It's the same mind you can use to alter that. You said such a wonderful thing in your opening commentary. You said, the call that is placed upon us by ourself mm -hmm. and that self with the capital S. Correct. That's really what we're speaking about, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. And when you use the word absolutist, it um, resonates deeply with my soul and also ruffles every feather that I have, you know, simultaneously. And part of that is because, and you and I have had conversations around this of, um, the 20th century metaphysician um, and the 21st century. I wouldn't say it's versus, um, where I believe that the difference for me relative to transformation and oftentimes the way that I teach is that in 20th century metaphysics, we were taught that you pay attention to every single thing that you put in your mind. And it's all about continuing to, um, it's about input, 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 input. Um, where I think that it is really important to be aware of what it is that you're putting in, what are we, what be aware of what it is that you're letting in as well, but also it's equally and sometimes more important to stop that, get quiet, and let that which is within rise up and make itself known to us, and so let those let that simultaneously happen as it guides us. Um, so. So I think that sometimes I see that as the difference. So I agree with you in the absolutist, but I also know that that term um, oftentimes is frightening to people for a couple of reasons. One is they don't have their training wheels on yet on how to learn how to use their mind, right? And it also can just simply be overwhelming because the spiritual truth that all is mind is a massive freaking idea. Yes. You know. And the other component talking about the input and the output is the mind and the heart. Because mm -hmm. I know in the early stages of science of mind studies, everything was geared toward that directing of the mind into the greater Correct. for greater good. And yet very little of anything was spoken about meditation and about the whole creative process of taking us 
from that familiar 18 inch journey from the head mm -hmm. into the heart. And now particularly in the world that we're living in and looking at and experiencing moment by moment, it's the heart of the man, the very soul, you know, the words that have been spoken about recapturing and renewing the soul of our entire nation, which has to start with ourselves. Absolutely. And I think that I, in my speaking of the differencing between 20th and 21st century metaphysics or metaphysicians, I'm not speaking ill of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I, I, in fact, I wouldn't be where I am in my life if it wasn't for that. But in the evolution of our philosophy, faith, way of life, and other related teachings, I believe that it's about um, it not not viewing it or engaging in it from such a mechanical way. Yeah. That right, it's it's more of the nature of the fluidity of that evolution. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, our beloved friend Dr. Maureen Hoyt, who says that we live in a world of and. So we can participate in what we define as the mechanical aspect of creation and we can live from the heart and we can ride the ride of both evolution and creation all of that can exist simultaneously because what we also teach which is also a big idea well it has to exist simultaneously because the spiritual truth is there's re it's really only one activity yes and that whole sense of inclusiveness has to start with ourselves, you know, because still I, I feel the biggest challenge to everything that's going on always with is that false sense of separation to really grasp that unity and that inclusiveness that I am, that which is one with all that is. And to have that, that solidified through our spiritual practices, I mean, now more than ever, to me, the spiritual practices are so important to all of us who are looking toward being the change agent that you talked about being. And if not within ourselves, again, where does it start? And Holmes himself said, if we were to just keep the mind at its intellectual, uh, real, linear thinking, we would be lost. It would be a very cold and impersonal. So it's that personal sense of the divine love that we are and the impersonality of the law which is moved by what we know we are in our true essence and nature very very well put you know our our um the organizational structures of our teaching um the one that we came from religious science international um latest theme was awakening humanity to its spiritual magnificence and then in the new iteration known as the centers for spiritual living the theme is creating a world that works for everyone really really big idea right but i want to give you a quote from the Tao and let you respond to that in the context of of those themes right and so the quote is if you want to awaken all of humanity then awaken all of yourself if you want to eliminate the suffering in the world, then eliminate all that is negative in yourself. Truly, the greatest gift you have to give is that of your own self-transformation. Ouch, and of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's relentless, no matter where you go and what you do, if you're inclined toward finding this inner world and letting it be the catalyst for what you're doing outwardly, I've got to start with me. And I think in my early days of pretty much ignoring the outer experience and the conditions, it was all the mind that has created the difficulty, is the mind that eliminates it, get to that mind. That has been more hurtful in many ways than it's been helpful. Because in that process, we all learn the fine art of stuffing, of suppressing, Correct. of repressing. And now suddenly in the mode of operation that we've been seeing, the shadow, the shadow is now talked about that unless you heal the parts of yourself that still remain unconscious, then you're just spinning the wheels at that superficial level of the thoughts that we habitually think rather than finding the heart and soul of it through just what you said, be still and know. Right. That has to be the origin of it all. 
I um, love that. And it's, it's, you so clearly went into that, which I've known you for so many years for being so clear on is that precision of yeah. here's what I know, right? And it is important to be tuned into what you know, while as I said earlier, to also be open to um, letting spirit rise up, letting that darkness rise up, not to live there. You don't have to create a parking lot or a bedroom there, but let it enough so that you can become aware you know, of that. I often, in my counseling sessions, tell the people I'm working with that the first step in this process is to become aware of your awareness. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Just begin to become aware that you're aware, because in the world that we live in, we forget that oftentimes, right? Yeah. So just to be, become aware of that. Yes, because what we're not aware of what hasn't passed through the lens of my own recognition. Oh, there it is, or here I am, or look what's happening. I can't do anything. Then of course, the next big step is, so what am I gonna do with what I'm aware of? What happens next? Exactly. So there's an integral spirituality, uh, which is pretty much spearheaded by Ken Wilber. They talk about waking up, staying up, cleaning up, clearing up, and then stepping up. You've got to go through the whole journey again. What's in my mind that's stopping me that I know about, but so much I don't know that I don't know. So Sue, will you repeat those steps again, please? Waking up. Wake up, yeah. So right. that's being aware. Oh, there's something more about mm -hmm. who I am and how I can use it. The second one is start cleaning and clearing up the things that say, no, that's not true. Come on, come back to the old familiar ways of the ego. Don't go there. Stay with me, that egoic thinking mind. And then it's really finding yourself going deeper within, stepping in more clearly to who you are. And everything that finally is out of the way that's been deterring the greater expression of who we are is then stepping up mm -hmm. into a new dimension of again, that, that call that's placed within us by ourselves that holds us to a greater standard. The real, for me, the gold standard is the divine within us. Mm -hmm. And I find it myself, I don't know about you, Keith, but it's not as easy to hold firm to these principles. My four favorite words that you refer, it's radical reliance upon the, the principle and it's precision consciousness that when I find the sharp edge has very much softened to take me to the places that are more familiar to me in my human mode, I've got to, again, just sharpen things up and come back to my prayer, to my silence. Right. So the language that I use for that is fine tuning your consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about fine tuning it because I'm a real believer of the work of Dr. David Hawkins of how everything that we do is all about emitting and attracting back a vibrational frequency, right? Now we process that through mind, but the frequent, because everything exists at the level of frequency. I've been watching this fantastic series called Cosmos, which is a recreation of those, you know, um, that's amazing, but it's a reminder of the magnitude of the universe that we live in and that everything exists as a vibrational frequency because it's all energy, right? And we're the same dust of the cosmos. We have the same cosmic dust as everything that's out there. And so then I'll speak for myself. So then for me, if I choose to live in a state of transformation with the objective being conscious evolution, right? Then it's important for me to be aware of how I'm using my energy i.e. consciously how am i fine tuning it knowing that i'm also human so that there are going to be moments that my actions reactions interactions with life itself as a human cannot reflect my divinity then as dr david walker used to always say take a deep breath mm -hmm. stop what you're doing get over it blanche and start anew you know, yes start anew. i mean the simplicity of you'll stop look and listen Stop the chatter, stop the distraction, and look within and listen to a calm, a quieter voice that can only be heard when there is a conscious and deliberate effort made to like a, a talking to an errant child going, shh, to ourselves. 
And particularly in today's environment, oh my right. God, it's like every moment calls us to it because that energy, that vibratory frequency you're talking about is exactly what we launch out into the world the moment we step across the threshold. That's the energy. I'm either bringing a, a calm demeanor and my conscious recognition and my oneness with God, or else I'm part of the scattering. I'm sharing the energy that's all around me. You're absolutely right. And, and one of the things that I think also, um, as a modern day metaphysician versus 20th century, that's important for us to realize is that old school thinking was when something awry was happening in our world, right? That, that mm -hmm. was where there's the call to come back. We would stop and say, well, what's in my consciousness that created me being in the middle of that? Well, that's not that's not necessarily the best way to spend your mental spiritual coin, my opinion. My opinion is just you can become aware of why you put yourself in a situation that may not be best for you, but then but begin to use your mind in a way to attract a new experience, right? Yes. Use your wisdom to guide you to a new experience, right? So let you stay aware of your energy, but then use it to um, be diff be that change, do something different, attract into your world. Because the thing that's important, I believe, for us to always remember, once again with Hawkins, is that not only is that energy field always happening, we're emitting out an energy field, 20th century calls that consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. And we're attracting back to us exactly unequal to that. That's the way yeah. the law works, right? And here so, again, that component of compassion because mm -hmm. if I'm blaming in the old 20th century what's in my consciousness, I'm right back in the old game of shame and blame, guilt and self-punishment. That's where the compassion that your beautiful Buddhist prayer today, it's can I open my heart to take responsibility for what I think, say, feel and do because it's all on my doorstep. Everything is my causing my my consciousness to somehow emanate what we're seeing locally, globally, and, and throughout the universe. But to bring the compassionate soul and heart of the man, and again, in harmony with the mind, letting the two be compatible instead of fighting each other, the power, the inner power struggle. I love that. So I've, I've got two things for that. One is that um, I love words and I love acronyms and play with that as I know you do. And so the breakdown that I learned years ago for the word passion mm -hmm. is to pass I, my divine nature on, right? Mm -hmm. So pass, pass my divine nature on. And so if one is going to live with compassion, you're living with the activity and the awareness and the action of passing my divinity on. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. living in a state of namaste. Yeah. But not just in a state of namaste through an awareness, it's an engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Of not only just seeing the divine, but honoring and engaging it. Well, that's difficult in today's world, granted our political climate. So the okay. second point I want to bring is something that our beloved friend, Dr. Jim Lockhart, uh, who was here one Sunday, sit, was talking about, he goes, what we're called to do as a modern day metaphysician is to not necessarily tend to our inner child, but to tend to our inner adult. Yes. Make yes. those decisions from a place of adulthood. Yes. So that's a very significant point for me because when I hear someone say, with all due respect and bless everybody in the same, but when I hear someone say, I am a child of God, I say, mm, <laughs> I'm spiritually, maturely expressing the nature of God. Because if we stay in that parental relationship, then again, I'm still relying on someone to take care of me or show me the way. So the Dude, truth that is brilliant. Oh, oh, ain't me. <laughs> well, it is. You as the channel. But I, say that, well, you just kind of frame that again, because I would love for our listeners and our um, viewers to hear that, because that statement of I'm a child of God, as endearing and as loving as it may be, you just shared the underpinning of why that's not an effective use of our consciousness. Right. So if we trace it back, because Jesus, the Christ consciousness that he exhibited and lived, said, I and the Father are one, because his endearing personal relationship with God was referred to as Abba, Father. 
So we did all adapt if we went in that way to knowing, well, I am a child of God too. I am the daughter or the son of God. So time marches on and here we are from the 20th to the 21st century and spiritual maturity is now being asked of all of us and what that spiritual maturity requires at that I have to free my parents. Remember again in the Bible, when Jesus was teaching with the rabbis and he left his parents, they all came to town. He stayed, did his studies and they left and then they couldn't find him. And when they did find him, they were very irate as parents would be. Well, why didn't you tell us where you were going? You didn't call, you didn't text, nothing, nada. <laughs> and he said, who are you? You know, I am my father of one, again, that parental, but I was about my father's business. Well, now we're about the source business. What is the source of life, of the energy that you're talking about? The very chemistry of this universe, which operates on love intelligence. Homes, love points the way, the law makes the way possible. And yet the spiritual maturity involves the stepping up, the cleaning up, the waking up, and then stepping up into putting on my big girl clothes, my big guy clothes, and stepping into this higher calling that is placed upon me by myself with the big cap S. Yeah. And when you speak of love, just for clarity for our viewers and listeners, is that we're not speaking of love in that um, human, esoteric way. We're speaking of love, as Dr. Holmes defines it, as the self-givingness of spirit whose desire is to create more of itself. And the only way it can create more of itself, out of itself, is through you and through me. Yeah. So it's being that open space for that energy that life light peace power be to rise up and make itself known through us right yeah. and again that love which emanated as the child internally emotionally mentally and parentally with god or with our, ourselves was the love that was being shared with the teddy bear or the puppy or the kitten or mommy and daddy which is an all-inclusive way of stepping up and letting that love still be there for the objective, for the outer people, places, and things. But now it's being embraced and immersed in a greater love. You know, it's that uh, eros, pathos, mm -hmm. and, you know. And agape. then agape. Agape. And we say it at the same time, yeah. Yeah. I love that evolution that you speak of because there may be individuals that didn't have even that human parental eros love that you speak of. May They may have been shown love in a really unhealthy way. And so to move this from the child mentality as an expression of the divine to an adult approach to that, um, where there is self-responsibility, while at the same time, one doesn't need to hold guilt or anger, it's about opening up as an adult to to make decisions that reflect the inner guidance that's being given to us. And maybe that's part of the divisiveness that we're seeing throughout our human world. You know, the fact that you don't agree with me, that somehow touches that unloved part. Because if you loved me, you would agree with me. And that's why it just astonishes me, my own and witnessing it all around me, the inflammatory emotional reaction that happens if I am engaging with or seeing the engagement of people who don't agree now politically or economically or any which. Oh, I'm with you. Yesterday, I got caught in a rally in, in Beverly Hills for um, a re-election of the person in the White House. And, um, and, um, and I'm not going to share my experience. I'm just, I'm just not going to do that. But what I am going to say is in, in my observation of being stuck in it, and it did, I didn't realize it until right now, um, what I was, what my, what I am now realizing what I was witnessing was indeed childish behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that relative to anyone's beliefs. It was the behaviors that I was yeah. seeing that were so childish. They really were not um, mature. They were very I, immature. Same thing. There was a rally in my local area too. And I almost, I wanted to chase the cars or do something to say, no, don't, don't do that. Please don't, don't do that. So to be able to step back and take that deep breath and stop, look within and listen to a higher calling that blesses the car or the people or right. the world as it's wandering by because what's wandering by is me. I'm only watching myself. 
Yeah. Okay. And I certainly bless the opportunity to protest. That's not the case at all. I bless that for all of us. It's just yeah. the behaviors that went with it. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. absolutely. so the next quote I have for us regarding transformation is allow the fires of and allow the fires of transformation to burn away all that doesn't serve you. Thoughts? So to burn away is, again, to come back and see what is it that burns me? What is the inflammatory edge that still causes me to either be blaming or judging or criticizing, wanting to strike out, wanting to sway people to my way of thinking, my insistence, the old, you want to be right or you want to be free, not right. only happy, but free. <laughs> so to burn that fire is to emerge in the fire of the spirit, you know, that the biblical quote that first the Christ consciousness was baptized by the water, symbolically, we've got to straighten the structures. We've got to be able, you know, to uh, see the, the food is provided, the home is provided, people are solid in their own existence of living before we could then burn the inner fire. Now let's let that higher phoenix rise out of what we've seen with the fires. It's also blessedly symbolic, telling us, go within and you'll see how this is all related. The fires related to the politics is related to the violence and all the symptoms that are saying what's causing and where am I at cause in a way of compassionate wisdom. Right. And what's being, what is being called forth to emerge? You referenced the Phoenix. I um, love the whole analogy of the fire in the sense of when we see the wildfires and in my memory, primarily of this was after one of the wildfires um, out near the Westlake Center for Spiritual Living Westlake Village. And I went out there for an event and within, it seemed like weeks. And I mean, when I mean like short numbers of weeks where the hills had been burned, there were already these new, the new growth that was emerging. It was just a reminder to me, um, A, that life indeed is infinite and that out of death and decay can come newness. And it really doesn't have anything to do with us. That it's, it's innate within nature. And I live that because I live in uh, below a hillside, which if I was evacuated in those days, and the fires indeed scorched some of our hills. And as things started to grow back, I would do Facebook postings and notices on just one clean line that would be the burned out stub of a tree or a bush. And right next to it, you could see the little green sprout starting to come up. And that's where we live. We live in the darkness. We live in the light. We live in what's scorched. We live in what's growing. And to bring the two compatibly together in a unity of that wisdom and compassion and love and intelligence is to come to the world with the energy of that there is another way. There always is an answer and everything is working for good. And you've got to bless it all exactly the way it's happening. I love it. So Dr. Sue, I'm going to ask you a question and then let you answer that because we're getting close on time and then I'll do the same. So what is your favorite Ernest Holmes quote and how does that relate to transformation? A perception of wholeness is the consciousness of healing. Say that again, please. The perception of wholeness is the consciousness of healing. If we're knowing our wholeness, meaning I see me whole and no matter what you think, feel, believe that may conflict with what I believe, you are whole, I am whole within every single thing, people, form, there is wholeness. And so to me, that's it. The perception of wholeness is a consciousness of healing. I love it. A couple, it may have been last week, I spoke of perception. Perception is how we see things. So it's really, that's and a really. That's up to your awareness. With exactly. We started yeah. awareness, perception. It's, that's what's real to me. However, I see it. And we're being asked to see an alternative, an ultimate reality. Yes, we are. And then participate in that alternative. Yeah. And yeah. what is it that I have to bring to it? Right. So my favorite Ernest Holmes quote, I have many, but this is the one I'll use today. Um, Spirit has placed the stamp of individuality upon itself and called it you. Yeah. So what that means to me in regards to transformation is that wholeness that you speak of um, exists within all of us, no matter who we are. 
what gender we are, what level of education we are, how we fall into what is deemed right or wrong or good or bad by society, what our sexual orientation is, no matter who or what, no matter, we are an individualization of that wholeness. And so as we tend to that, wholeness within us as an individual, transformation must ensue because that's the nature of nature. Yeah. Dr. Sue, I love you so much. We could do this for hours, I believe. Yes, I don't know if we would keep our viewers, but we I'm sure you and I would have fun. Well, I know we would. I said to you on Friday, let's stop and talk on, online. So good. Love it too. Yeah. And I just want to know, want you to know how much as a community we love and appreciate you. I know that for many years when this community had gone through some transitions, you were here for us. And so you are a piece of this community, uh, literally a piece of the puzzle. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And right back at you. You're doing a wonderful work. Keep, keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know that I love you. I can't wait till the um, restrictions are lifted so you and I can meet for our fun lunches and yeah. um, laugh and have a good time. Um, I'm going to say that again. That one's on me, remember. Okay, the next one's on you. We'll go with that. So. Uh